cooking to Columbia, seeking lower wages. They got just what they came for, but as we turn the pages, we find the workers do not like the sound of their children's hungry cries. So they said, we'll join the union. They began to organize. So Coke called up a terrorist group called the AUC. Said we've got some problems at the factory. The AUC went to the plant, killed two union men, told the rest you leave the union. Hello, everyone. Um, you know, my Morgan Ann and I are figure skating fans, so we watched the Olympics quite a bit the last few weeks ago. And and we keep hearing the term legendary. Legendary, the legendary Russian skate is the proto of the legendary coach, Tamar Lasvina, legendary coach, Frank Carroll. I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to meet someone who's legendary? You know, some of fun, interesting thing. But of course, those people are sports figures, and it's basically entertainment. But we have amongst us someone who is legendary, and not just legendary for uh, something that entertains us, but for doing, accomplishing things that save people's lives, that give people a safe uh, place to work, that give them a safe water to drink, and safe homes in which to live. Um, the, and that person is Ray Rogers. The, there's a couple of things I've learned about Ray. One is that, he has an incredible sense of generating ideas, generating campaigns. At least once a day, I'm sure, he thinks of some really good campaign that will work. And, Ray, and when I talked to Ray on the phone, I said, whoa, whoa, Ray, we're, we're in upstate New York. Let's, okay, I'm going to Binghamton, which is where he was last night at SUNY Binghamton. Okay, good, and then we're gonna do talk to, we're gonna do the Killer Coke, and we're going to have a connection with the American Academy of Pediatrics who thinks Coca-Cola is a wonderful corporate sponsor or organizational sponsor, which is unbelievable. So, so he's, he's got a campaign going. He has so many oranges up in the air, you people will simply not believe until you hear him speak. Secondly, he has a legendary sense of humor, as in this morning. Hi, Arnie. I'm in New York City. I'll make it there for Saturday night for sure. <laughs> Legendarily cruel sense of humor, but in retrospect, it was funny. And, and uh, so, so it is really an honor and a privilege to give him our White Dove Award. I'd like to ask Ray to come up now so I can present this award to him. presents its 2014 International White Dove Award to legendary union activist and organizer Ray Rogers of the Campaign to Stop Killer Coke. During a life dedicated to promoting worker justice in the United States and abroad, Rogers pioneered the strategy of the corporate campaign. For the past decade, he has led the campaign to protect workers in Latin America from anti-union violence perpetrated by the Coca-Cola Company. Friday, March 14th, 2014, 26th Annual Rice and Beans Dinner, Gates Presbyterian Church, Rochester, New York. Congratulations, Ray. First of all, I want to say how much I appreciate the great history of the Rochester Committee on Latin America for all the good work that you've done. And in accepting this award, I want to accept it on behalf of those union leaders and advocates of social justice in Latin America who have lost their lives. I also want to accept the award on behalf of those who still have the courage to stand up and continue that struggle. So thank you so much for the ovation, but let me tell you something. This is for all of you. Okay, this is for all of you and the work that you've been doing. Now, I'm just going to move my award over here. 
So nothing happens to it. You know, we know the importance of labor unions. We know the importance to protect the wages, to, to protect the wages and benefits, to protect the rights of workers. That's something we all know. In places like Colombia and Guatemala, the importance of having a strong union can mean the difference between life and death. Now, I'm going to be talking about Coca-Cola in Latin America, particularly with respect to Colombia, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Mexico. And if my time runs out, I only make it to a portion of it, but you can go to our website, killercoke.org, and you'll find everything you want to learn about what Coke is doing throughout Latin America and around the world. First of all, I want to say that the campaign to stop killer coke is a campaign based on the volunteer efforts of thousands of people worldwide. I want to make something very clear. The campaign to stop killer coke is a movement of we's and not ours. And we need all the help that we can get. The world of Coca-Cola, and by the way, all the statements I make up here, I can back up. They're backed up, well documented on the website, killercoke.org. And I challenge Coca-Cola to sue me for anything I've said. Why? Because truth is a strong defense. The world of Coca-Cola is a world full of lies, deception, immorality, corruption, and widespread labor, human rights, and environmental abuses. When you think of the Coca-Cola company, you should think of a company that has inflicted great hardship and despair upon many people and communities throughout the world. It's also a company that is aggressively marketing unhealthy products to children that they know fuel the childhood high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes epidemics. Yet they continue to aggressively market to children, even though they're claiming that they will not market to children under the age of 12. If that's the case, why do they have 719 toys? directed, as they say, for children three years and up. Why do they run a Super Bowl ad when you see one of the ads, when at the end of the ad there's a kid who's under 12 years old, the whole ad was based on Adrian, they paid six million dollars for the one minute ad, and there's Adrian at the end. He scores a touchdown in this big professional football stadium with Green Bay Packers. And a groundskeeper is there, reaches into a cooler and says, here kid, and where does he a kid? Of course, it's a bottle of Coca-Cola. When you see Coke's ads and displays, you should think of crimes and other misconduct so unthinkable that all of Coca-Cola's beverages become undrinkable. Now in short, how can I best sum up in one sentence what the Coca-Cola company and the Coca-Cola system is about? Let me just say that the Coca-Cola system operates like a criminal syndicate with impunity. Uh, let me get into some specifics of what I'm talking about. I'll be talking about timing that goes back from the 70s right up to present. And I want to make sure, because I know we've got a tight schedule. Right now it's 20 after 7, okay? And what time should I end? 7.45, okay. So I may not finish everything, I may just say because you might like to ask me some questions. I've also, by the way, talked to uh, Jim Bertoloni, and what I'm hoping is that after the, everything is done, the presentations, that you will all hold one of those signs that you've got on your seats. On the back, they explain what Coca-Cola has been doing in Latin America. Also, on the outside, it's uh, the slogan, uh, shut down SO, stop, what, what is this? There. Right here. Okay. Shut down SOA, stop killer coke. All right. On the back, it talks about what Coca Cola is doing. And again, as you, I'm very supportive of the shutdown SOA movement because a lot of the paramilitaries that are trained there are the ones that are going out and killing these uh, workers that are trying to stand up and fight for the rights and the protection of workers uh, throughout Colombia, Guatemala, and other areas of Latin America. Let me start out in 19. Well, from 1990 to 2012, there have been nine union leaders, Coca-Cola workers, who have been murdered because of the union activities. And there was a lawsuit that was initiated in 1996 
around the murder of a union leader, Isidro Gill. Isidro, at the plant, paramilitaries went up, shot him 10 times, assassinated. This was during the time of intense negotiations. The same night, the union building was set ablaze and all the equipment was destroyed. The next day, hard, heavily armed paramilitaries were allowed to march into the Coca-Cola plant. I should add that the Coca-Cola manager had a history of collaborating and socializing with the paramilitary groups and had said publicly that he ordered them to destroy the union sinaltanol that represents most of the Coca-Cola workers that we're talking about. When he rounded up all those workers, they gave them a choice. If you don't resign from the union by 4 p.m. that day, they would meet the same feat as the Cedro men. They too would all be murdered. There were about 50 of them. Resignation forms had been prepared ahead of time by Coca-Cola management, and they all signed those resignation forms in mass and fled the area. So Coca-Cola got rid of all the experienced unionized workers that were being paid $380 a month, and the new hirees would now receive $130 a month. Now, you say, okay, you're going back to 1996, in this case, in the first lawsuit, the lawsuit which came right out and said that it was accusing Coca-Cola of complicity uh, in these murders and in these, the torture and the kidnapping of these union leaders and contracting with these paramilitary groups. If I go back, before we got involved in this, and I'm sorry, everything's kind of falling down, so I'll find pieces I need it. When I had two of the best human rights attorneys in the country come to me and said, Ray, we have a serious problem. This was 10 years ago. We have a serious life and death situation. We really need your help, but we don't have any money. And I said, oh, great. I need another one of those, no money. And when they told me what was going on in Colombia, where Coca-Cola was involved in, I thought, this is unbelievable. But here I got Dan Kavalik, the Associate General Counsel of the United Steelworkers, Terry Collinsworth, the head of International Labor Advocates, great credibility. And I said, I got to do some investigation, but we'll build this from the ground up. I happened to get copies of a book called Soft Drink, Hard Labor, published by the Latin America Bureau in England in 1987. Just let me read the back, a little bit about the history of Coca-Cola. The past is part of Coca-Cola's present. Don't anybody forget that. They always like to talk about the past. It's about the past because their past is the present. On the back of the book, for nine years, the 450 workers at the Coca-Cola bottling plant in Guatemala City fought a battle with their employers for their jobs, the trade union, and their lives. Three times they occupied the plant, on the last occasion for 13 months. Three general secretaries of the union were murdered and five other workers killed. Four more were kidnapped and have disappeared. But against all the odds, they survived thanks to their own extraordinary courage and help from fellow trade unionists in Guatemala and around the world. It was a huge international campaign of protests and boycotts was central to winning their struggle. I would like to tell you that the Guatemala situation got all taken care of. But in 2010, Terry Collinsworth, who I mentioned earlier, filed a lawsuit. It's in U.S. District Court in New York. And I give these lawyers a lot of credit because they've stuck their neck up, they put their lives in the line with all the groundwork that they've laid in the lawsuits in Colombia and in Guatemala. Do I think that there's a chance these lawsuits the ones in Columbia, the judge who wanted nothing to do with them, they end up getting dismissed. Nothing about the marital lawsuits. Okay? The judge made it very clear, and we have many quotes on our website, that shows that how this judge, Judge Jose Martinez in Miami, Florida, and Ray Rogers says he's corrupt. He should recuse himself from the Coca-Cola case, and he should not be a judge. All right? And if he wants to sue me, let him. Because the facts are there to back it up. The conflicts of interest between this judge and Coca-Cola are uh, just like this, okay? Like brother and sister solidarity. But that's Coca-Cola in this judge. So there's no fairness there. The cases of Guatemala, as I said to Terry, what's going on? Well, Ray, Coca-Cola, you know, they wanted to get the case back to Guatemala, okay? And uh, the Guatemala now won't take it because it's in the U.S. courts. 
So this is going to go on for years. You know, and let's face it, a lot of times when justice is done, if it is done through the courts, a lot of people are dead before justice is ever served. So that's a little something about Guatemala on our website. We also have a couple of interviews in Spanish and are also translated in English from two union leaders from Guatemala. One is on political asylum here in Connecticut. He barely missed being assassinated. In fact, there was somebody who looked just like him that got assassinated, he escaped. They were after Mr. Plasters. Then there's Alberto, Alberto Vicente. Alberto, how he is still alive in Guatemala is beyond me, standing up and fighting for the Union. His son and nephew were murdered, and his teenage daughter was gang raped as a warning to him to stop his Union activities. We have a couple of fellows in Guatemala, I mean in Colombia, in Colombia now, going from Guatemala over to Colombia. We have two union leaders there, William Mendoza and Mark Carlos Galvez. The company's claiming that they put a bomb, planted a bomb, or threatening to plant a bomb. And they're very concerned about ending up in prison because back in 1996, just before Isidro was assassinated, there were three union leaders, three union leaders and co workers. who were in prison. And I don't want to uh, goof up on their names. I have trouble with some of these, uh, with the Spanish names, but Alvaro Gonzalez, Domingo Flores, and Luis Garcia. Coates claimed in Colombia that they had planted a bomb. They ended up in the most horrible prison conditions for six months before the judge said no. No bomb was ever planted, and these men were set free. So what Gonzalez had to say in 2008, what he'll say today. This was in a book, The Coke Machine, by Michael Blandin. Gonzalez halts again, choking back the tears. Quote, they want to destroy the union, and because of that, the collective bargaining gets worse, and the conditions for the workers get worse. You get so fucking pissed off by your helplessness. You get in such an extreme psychological state. You want to be a suicide bomber and just finish it off. He said, I may have gotten out of prison and I got my job back, but it's still just like being in prison. I just mentioned the name of Juan Carlos Galvez to you. Juan came to me in New York, and he only speaks Spanish, and I only speak English, we have an interpreter. And I'll get in a little bit to what he said to me. I'll never forget it. For that reason, I'll never stop beating this company until we win. And we're going to win. But he's also quoted in a book, The Coca-Cola, The Coke Machine. And Juan said, the constant pressure of driving around with bodyguards Waiting for the next death threat has clearly gotten to him. That's Michael Blandin saying that, the author. It is tough, Galva says. We are on the brink of death, but we keep surviving. We bring in new members to the union, but the company fires them. If it weren't for the international solidarity, solidarity like we have here tonight, if it weren't for the international solidarity, we would have been eliminated long ago. That is the truth. When Juan came to my office and sat down with me after doing some demonstrating up in New York City, a man, I'm not that tall, and he's about this tall. I looked at this guy and I thought, he's out handing out leaflets in New York City in front of the building of Barry Dillon, one of the board of directors of Coke. And I'm thinking as people walk by, they have any idea what this man that is going through, how courageous this man is. I've never met more courageous or smarter leaders in the union or anywhere else than I have from Colombia and Guatemala. But this is what Juan said to me, and I hope you'll remember this 
because it sure is the kind of thing that I'll never forget. He said, Ray, he said, if we lose this struggle against Coke, first we will lose our union, then we will lose our jobs, and then all of us will lose our lives. That's how important a strong union is. And that's how important it is for people like yourself, the work that the Rochester Committee on Latin America is doing. And that's why it's so important to meet the fine labor leaders, including Jim Berloni, the head of the Rochester Labor Committee, for the work that they've been doing for so many, many years. And I'm proud to be up here because of what the committee is brought to me. And believe me, it comes at an important time in our campaign. It's going to be very, very helpful, which you've done. It already is. And I know that I, I've read when Arnie mentioned that Jim Bertoloni, is it Jim Bertoloni? Isn't even the Postal Workers Union? I've read some terrific stuff that guy's written. Really bright guy. So I'm very honored to be up here with him as well. And I'm looking for my watch. Did that go too? Because I will speed things up. Okay. Got another 13 minutes. Um, now standing out starting a demonstration at Coca-Cola's annual meeting. I've been to everyone for the last two years. And I was assaulted, very serious assault in 2004. And quite frankly, if weightlifting hadn't been my hobby for the last uh, 55 years, I uh, would have probably be paralyzed, or either that or would have been probably paralyzed for life based on the assault at their annual meeting. For one thing, standing up at the microphone and raising its issues. And only standing up there for a few minutes. I wasn't breaking any laws. That's another whole story. And I kept talking. And again, uh, I should also add, if you don't think we're getting a Coca-Cola, the CEO of Mutar Kent, this is why it's so important, and I know that the uh, Rock Club put on everybody's table a letter that you can sign to the head, Mutar Kent, the CEO of Coca-Cola, please, if you don't have a copy, get one, please sign it, turn it into Rock Club, because they're gonna send them down as a whole package, Mutar Kent made $30 million, over $30 million last year. And by the way, in 2001, the CEO of Coca-Cola, who in 2004, the bureau chief of Business Week uh, told me, he says, you know, you are correct, you forced his resignation early. But in 2001, he made $105 million as the head of Coca-Cola. A lot of money, you know. So you get an idea of these people with this greed and this power, they don't care about human lives, whether it be Latin America or anywhere else. So, sat out in front of the annual meeting, somebody comes and says, look, we've got an announcement to make during the demonstration, this was in 2004. Efren Guerrero, who was a hunger striker, protester, union leader of Sinaltona, they just went to his, I think it was his brother-in-law's home, and his brother, his brother, his brother-in-law, I think it was, and his wife were murdered, machine gun style, and three of the children were all injured. Okay, these are the kind of things that happen. William Mendoza, who I mentioned earlier, they threatened to cut his four-year-old daughter up into pieces if he didn't quit his union activities and put her in a plastic bag. Javier Correa, very courageous, I don't know how he's still alive, gets death threats almost daily, the head of the Sinaltonal Union. This is what's going on. And these murders, like I say, I'm talking from 1990 to 2012, when President Richard Trump sent the letter to President Obama, outraged over the murder of another Coca-Cola worker who was also a Sinaltonal Union official, and what was going to be done about this by the U.S. government and its foreign policy. So when Coca-Cola comes forward and says, oh, that's all in the past, baloney. It's not in the past, it's today, and it's happening today. I mentioned, there's so much more I could talk about in Colombia. Real quick, Guatemala, no, I'm sorry, El Salvador. 2004 Human Rights Watch did a report. Coca-Cola is benefiting in the supply chain from illegal hazardous child labor, harvesting sugar cane from the fields in El Salvador for, for sugar suppliers. In 2007, a filmmaker from the UK did a documentary that they have a primetime national TV in England showing these young children, the footage taken in 2007, three years later, harvesting sugar cane. It's on my website, killacoke.org, or the campaign's website, killacoke.org. You can see these kids. And I can tell you right now, those kids are still harvesting sugar cane, and this sugar cane harvesting for sugar, Coke sugar supplies is going on all around the world. I'm 
I'm going to be coming out with a report in about two weeks. I hope you go to killercoat.org, you'll see a thing that says join. Put in your email address and you'll get a copy of that and any newsletters we send out. You won't get a lot of stuff, you won't get barrage, okay? And it's called Buying Respectability, Coca-Cola and the Corporate Social Responsibility Fraud. And you're going to be surprised about what you read about how they buy respectability, giving money to groups that some of you may be giving money to, and how they're buying uh, their res respectability from them, and how they co opting them in so many respects. Okay, I got uh, eight more minutes. Um, so there's a child labor issue. Let me go to Mexico. And man, did I get some good news recently. I get a call from that fellow who was a big player. He was, he was a rising star in Mexico, a marketer, big marketing guy for Coca-Cola. He called me. He says, look, I'm aware of the work you're doing. This was in 2007. I want to tell you my story. Coca-Cola called me in to a meeting and wanted me to embark upon a campaign, an illegal campaign, to destroy all the competition in the 700,000 mom and pop stores throughout Mexico. He said, I told him it was illegal. We've been fined millions in the past for doing that. I wouldn't do it. Into the meeting. He gets called into another meeting. They put an armed guard outside the door. They bring in a notary for one reason to see him under duress, sign a letter of resignation. When he realized what was going on, he says, My God, I have a, you know, young children. My wife was only in my 30s, so he resigned. They owe me a lot of money, profit sharing and all that. As it turns out, Coca Cola said to him, You never work for us. We owe you nothing. He filed a labor and criminal lawsuits. I got involved in a thing. I raised the issue. You'll see a poster. I raised the issue with Luke Kott Kemp, the CEO of the last three years at the annual meeting. Three years in a row he lied that this man even existed. There was no such employee. Then he made a mistake saying he was an employee. Then he said these lawsuits don't exist, although we got coverage all over Mexico in the major publications, biggest newspapers and magazines about the lawsuit. And he lies, he lies, he lies. That's what Coke is. It's all about lies and deception. What his case has led to is what we've turned out and I've raised is that Coca-Cola for about 25 years has been cheating Mexican workers out of hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation that they should have been getting. And by doing that, they've also cheated the Mexican government out of untold hundreds of millions of dollars through a system of tax evasion through the illegal scheme of outsourcing. The, uh, one of the things that, um, you know, again, I've got five minutes. I just, I, you know what I should do? I should, there's so much. I just want to say with Mexico also, Vicente Fox was the president of Mexico from 2000 to 2006. Before he was the president of Mexico, he was the head of Coca-Cola Mexico in Latin America. And when he became the head of Mexico, he gave Coca-Cola 27 quote, quote, concessions to steal the water from indigenous lands and to pollute the water. Okay? And so Coca-Cola literally, particularly in southern Mexico, they have literally destroyed the water resources. And if you go to Mexico, it has the highest per capita consumption of Coca-Cola in the world. Per capita consumption is 745 eight ounce per person. 745 eight ounce containers. The US is 486. I can also tell you that Mexico is suffering a very serious case of obesity and diabetes, not only with the whole population, but with children in particular. And Coca-Cola is not going to market to children. Well, in Mexico, they've been running TV ads, and they're using superheroes, Superman, Wonder Woman, you know, other superheroes. And the, the Institute of Health in Mexico has shown that using these superheroes get coaxed to go for a healthier diet. And what are they doing? They're using the superheroes on these ads all over TV in Mexico to promote Coca-Cola with the little kids. All right, I got four minutes to go, and I could talk for days and hours. I'm giving you a little taste of what's been happening, but any questions you might want to, and I'll be around after if you have questions, but I know we, uh, go ahead, questions for anybody. Um, I just would like to know, what would you like us to do to help you? Great, question. Number one, sign those letters and get them over to uh, Rockla. Let's get those in. Number two, how many of you here are teachers? Anybody? Maybe, okay. How many of you do you belong to either anybody with the NEA? NEA. AFT. 
AAUP, I'm going to send an open letter to the presidents of the international unions. I'm going to send it out to thousands of their locals. And I'm going to say to each of these union leaders, because I'm sick of trying to go through some of the bureaucracy, I want to know who's going to protect the children, not only throughout the U.S., but worldwide from this company called Coca-Cola, when it comes to child labor and destroying their health. And I want each of those conventions this year to pass a resolution to ban Coca-Cola from all facilities and all functions of their unions and send that to all their locals as well. So uh, any help that I can get from the teacher fund, I want. Any organizations that you are a part of, whether it be a church or a labor union, and believe me, retirees, okay, I know you can have a lot of clout with these organizations, all right? But ask them, pass a simple resolution. If you need help, call Ray with the campaign to stop killer coke. Pass a resolution banning Coca-Cola from all your facilities and functions until they clean up their act. We post them, we send them out in our newsletters, and it begins to show a movement. And this is what it's going to take. I think, I don't know if I told you that, I was beginning to say, maybe I stopped, that the CEO of Mutar Kent comes over and says to me, Mr. Rogers, I think if we're going to iron out our differences, we need to sit down and have a meal together. So I said, fine, I'm all for it. So then, he gets up on stage with Warren Buffett. You know Warren Buffett? Well, he owns over 9%. He's the biggest shareholder in Coke. He's also a big fraud. At one time, I thought I'd vote for the guy for president. He is a fraud in so many respects, okay? Anyway, he, um, so when I get to ask my question and slam him, I, I said, look, I appreciate uh, your, your idea of sitting down and having a meal together. I might suggest you invite Warren Buffett to join us. Two weeks later, I get a call from the head of investor relations at Coke. Mr. Kent's very serious. He wants to fly up to New York and have the meeting. Let me know. I'll make it a top priority. That was the last I heard of him. And it may be because he was trying to save the City University of New York. We wiped Coca-Cola completely out of the City University of New York. We prevented them from getting that exclusive point rights contract for the entire university. We had already knocked them out of three campuses. They had eight more. This is costing Coke hundreds, not tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in losses just in revenues over the period of the next 10 years and hundreds of millions more in brand name promotion and identity. Any of you that can be linked to schools in any way, if you have children, grandchildren in schools, anywhere, college or universities, and I had somebody come up with me, a couple of people from Nazareth College says, we'd like to get you there. We're a Coke campus, we'd like to do something about it. If you're not sure, I'm gonna work with you. Okay, and so that's just uh, some of the things that uh, you can do, and it is, I only have one more minute. Yes. Use a microphone here. Yeah. Yeah. On page 12 of your program, there's a don't buy a list of Coca-Cola products. I'm sure nobody in this room drinks any of them, <laughs> but you may know someone who does. Uh, you could just copy and distribute that. Boycotts are still an effective way to punish bad businesses. Thank you very much. Page 17. Page 17. Page 17. Beg your pardon. And if you go to our website, by the way, you will find a list of uh, hundreds of products that Coca-Cola promotes. Okay, i got 30 seconds. I'm going to leave you with one last reminder about what our story was all about. I was working with coal miners back in the 70s when the union, a union leader by the name of John Kiblonsky was running for the presidency of a corrupt mine workers union. There's a movie that was done on him. He, his wife, and his daughter, after he lost the election, they were all murdered at their home in Pennsylvania. So we went after Tony Boyle, who so-called won the election. Not only did we knock out the leadership that was in the mine workers back in 1972, but Tony Boyle ended up in prison, where he spent the rest of his life for those murders. But when I was out there campaigning for the new, for the miners for democracy slate, I remember a guy by the name of Wally. He was a Polish man. I can't think of his last name. And he said something to me. And in some respects, it makes you very sad. But this is why Rockla and all of us that are fighting the way we are is to maybe have Wally not have to say something like this. I said, Wally, here you are, 55 years old, and you're still single. And I could say this because I was in my 20s then. 
And I said, I'm incredible with your compassion and your zest for life and your empathy. How is it that you're not married and have children? He says, let me explain it this way, Ray. He said, neither slaves nor soldiers will I produce for the rich and powerful. It's a sad commentary from somebody who doesn't want to get married and have children because he did not want to produce slaves and soldiers for the rich and powerful. Thank you, thank you so much. Last weekend I went to see that Liam Neeson movie non-stop over here at Tinseltown. And nowadays you don't just go to the movies, now you gotta pay to watch advertisements before you get to watch the three hours of trailers and then you get to see the movie. But there was this one and it was a beautiful advertisement, very expensive, very well done. Gave you a nice warm, fuzzy feeling. And at the end it said, Coca-Cola is happiness. And I said, well, they haven't talked to Ray Rogers then. <laughs> so you, you can't believe everything you see in the movies or on advertisements. And um, it's not just Coca-Cola. It happens uh, in many other areas, too, the gold mines in Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador and elsewhere. These corporations are just getting out of control. So we've all got to pull together and, uh, and fight this. Um, and that's also the reason why Coca-Cola pulled their sponsorship of tonight's dinner. So great, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, I'd like to call on Marilyn Anderson and John Garlick to introduce our uh, local white dog winners. Back in the time when Wayne Kirkland was running it, 
and you weren't supposed to be doing that. And Ron Pettengill helped uh, get us moving on this front. Um, I'm sorry that Gary Bonadonna can't be here tonight. He's with the uh, Workers United, formerly the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers, and he played a critical role because one of the first international unions to really get behind all of this was active when Jack, Jack Shankman went down uh, and did the Makila plants and saw what was going on. And he went down with Dave Dyson. Dave Dyson came and spoke to our labor council, spoke to Rockwell. So we have a long history with, uh, with that. Uh, Bruce Popper, Executive Vice President, SEIU 1190 in Upstate. Come on, Bruce. Yes, say hi. Uh, he's a founding member also of the Rochester Labor Committee on Central America. Dan Maloney, President, uh, United Auto Workers 1097. Hi, Dan. Uh, and we did a lot of work with uh, Dan around uh, NAFTA issues. And now here is NAFTA back with TPP. So uh, I'm sure that Jim will talk about that. Jeff Nazanski, who was benefits rep of uh, IUE 509, and also a founding member of the Rochester Labor Committee. Freddie um, Masick, chair of the Retiree Committee, not Freddie, and Denise Young, who's the Young from Public Employees Federation, and there's supposed to be some other people in here who didn't make it. But, um, we're an active council. We like doing work in solidarity with you, and Jim will talk more about what that means. I'm going to read the words here on the white double board. Rochester Committee in Latin America presents its 2014 Local White Dove Award to the Rochester Labor Council AFL-CIO in recognition of its decades of solidarity with workers in Latin America through member education, resolutions, boycotts, petitions, letters, marches, meetings, and demonstrations the Rochester Labor Council has supported worker rights in Latin America and opposed U.S. policies that undermine labor both in the U.S. and abroad. And so we're really happy to give this to the Labor Council and to Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Labor Council and all the work, um, you know, I'm, I'm humbled to accept this. And again, I want to mention all those people, but I especially want to mention, you know, Ray said it in his speech, Brother Garlock uh, said it, for too many years because of the Cold War, and if you go back to the time I was a child, um, I believe it was 55, our other historian will correct me, when Che Guevara watched. Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Dulles um, take a democratically elected president out in Guatemala. You know, we helped create Che Guevara. And um, I like to tell people the only difference between Che Guevara and George Washington is uh, Che gave up wealth and he killed less people than Washington and he didn't own slaves. Um, but uh, that's what Ray is talking about is not new. And the Cold War was used as a cover for slavery and indentured servitude and denying justice throughout Latin and South America for many, many years. So um, besides all those people you mentioned, I again want to mention my predecessor, our President Emeritus, Ron Pettengill, who was stood up along with our leaders, John Garlick and Marilyn Anderson at Rockwell, who stood up in spite of the AFL-CIO policy as head of this Labor Council, AFL-CIO, during the Cold War, 
and continue to fight for the rights of these people. So for all of labor and especially for Ron Pattengale, please let's hear a hand for those people. And I take my glasses off because I haven't got my bifocals yet, so it's hard for me to read with my glasses on. But um, I, I also want to say, uh, Ray and I got to talk a little bit today. We have you know, a lot of people in common, but um, I, I think Ray knows you know, my local, many unions. I became aware of Ray many years ago in the struggle um, at P9 and Hormel. And um, I'm a long tire, time admirer of him, so it's such an honor to have dinner with him. And I'm so glad you honored him here tonight. Um, and I know when it comes to our Hispanic brothers and sisters, uh, some of you are here tonight. Um, my wife um, is from Puerto Rico, came here when she was about five years old, is very fluent in Spanish. Um, unfortunately, I am not. I'm only. Um, familiar with the terms of endearment that she's used for me for the last 30 years, you know, like stupido and pendejo. Um, you know, so other than that, I really don't speak Spanish, so. But again, I want to congratulate Ray. It's an honor for him to be awarded, and, and I'm, I'm humbled to accept this award on all those great people we mentioned on behalf of the Labor Council. But I want to mention two things here. And again, Ray, he calls it how he sees it, and I think we all need to do that. Sometimes, and I've, I was a history major in college, and I've had these discussions with John. I see part of the 20th century of American history as progressives who would rather be right than win. Um, who's more right, who's more ideologically correct? We've got to learn to do a better job of fighting for, a, for and about the things we agree on and start playing to win. Um, and some of that is language. When I was young, even the right wing in that papers printed a lot more columnists. And one that I remember when I was young, who's passed away many years, he used to be on the page with the local um, columnists, uh, I think Irma Bomb Bombeck and the late uh, political satirist Art Buckwald. And his name was Sidney Harris. And he's what nobody knows today. He was a linguist, talked about language. And language is so important. And we know, you know, right to work has nothing to do with having a right to a job and Americans for Prosperity and all these right-wing groups. Um, but we've also got to be smart about language. The hardcore center of the anti-union racist Tea Party as white senior citizens. What is the most popular government programs among white senior citizens? Medicare and Social Security. So when healthcare reform, our push for years started, what did we call Medicare? Single payer. And every time we said it, we had to explain what it was. I'm still getting Local 800 in Omaha endorses single payer. You know, they're still coming late to the party. Labor did this many years ago. We have to connect with people. Uh, so language is important. And part of that language, and so much about what Ray talked about, um, is about these trade agreements since NAFTA, which have very little to do about trade. One of the language changes I've seen since NAFTA, you know, if you grew up during the Cold War, you heard about capitalism and communism, capitalism and communism. If you stop and think about it, for the last 20 years, you have hardly hear anybody in this country talk about capitalism anymore. Like free trade, it's the free market. It's the free market because capitalism is what it is. It's about the rights of capital. It's not about the rights of people. It's not about democracy. It is solely about the rights of capital. So they've changed their language. We've got to recognize that and, and put that out there. And we also have to talk about, um, we had the pleasure last week to be, able to be with another um, longtime person many of us admire, Bill Fletcher, Jr who just put out a book about 20 myths about unions. One of them is that, you know, even the rich boys will say, well, unions, they'll give us a backhanded compliment. Unions had their day. 
Um, they were important once, you know, to help raise standards of living, but now we're all too progressive for that. What Ray told you is just one company. They are doing the same things that they did in the 19th century and the early 20th century and every third world country in the world. And I don't want to point out, there's the small businessman who wants to get in the Chinese market and hires Chinese to sell the Chinese. I mean, that's been going on forever. Kodak here, in the 50s, had a plant in Brazil where they hired Brazilian workers and sold cameras at Brazilian prices. But they did not sell American products to Americans or outsource labor and take their jobs. These agreements are not about trade. They are about the power of capital over people. And what these are, just like Coca-Cola, is these are criminals. These are fugitives from justice. Stop and think what they are doing. They are running away from the law in this country and all the progress made in Western civilization since the end of slavery. They're running against minimum and living wages. Strikes in Bangladesh after the horrors there last year, textile companies are moving to Vietnam where the minimum wage is 27 cents an hour. They're running for minimum wage, they're running for the eight, from the eight hour day, which many American workers died for. And over time, they're running away from social security and paying social security taxes, for paying any taxes, from public paying the taxes to support public uh, education. Uh, they're running away from child labor laws. And again, we saw in Bangladesh, which before a factory collapse where 1,100 women mostly women and girls, because they use child labor there, 70 hours a week, 40 to 80 dollars a month, died. Bangladesh was having pretty much the equivalent of our Triangle Shirtwaist Fire every year and a half to two years then. Now, quite often, unlike the idiots at Coke, they do it through multiple subcontractors, but they're still doing it. They're still doing it. And during the Cold War, our military was often used as a front for it. Um, Non-discrimination laws, safety laws. Even countries that have safety laws, um, they're not enforced because they need the economic development. One of the late union leaders in our country, Tony Mizaji, who we consider the founder of OSHA, said you protect workers in the workplace, you'll protect the environment. Most of the poisons we have start in the workplace. Regulation costs money, safety costs money. If I can do production cheaper using asbestos, mercury, lead, PCPs, you name it, I'm running away from the law, from the rule of law. I get law. This is, again, this is corporate criminals and we need to call them. It's not about free trade. This is the criminal billionaire and millionaire class. They sold the world a bill of goods, how we're going to uplift people. If anybody's seen the recent Oxfam, Oxfam report, it is worse as it's ever been in history. We now have 85 people who have as much money as half the people on the planet, three and a half billion dollars. And if you think terrorism will ever stop with that kind of planet and that kind of in income and quality, you're kidding yourselves. So again, on behalf of the Rochester Labor Council and all the good work, my brothers and sisters in labor and their unions, um, it's an, an honor to be here with Ray and see him honor. It's an honor to represent the Labor Council, always has been. Um, I've been a labor advocate now, this is my 41st year, um, and to be with John and Marilyn, um, I thank you all, keep up the good work, we're going to stay in there for you, uh, with you, and uh, before anybody leaves, we want you, Ray and I would like you to all come up here, we're going to hold signs, and I think we would like to do it this way, unless Ray wants to do it different, because I'm thinking maybe in the background, the most famous of the world's martyrs um, symbol should be in back of us. Um, and um, for these pictures with the killer coke signs. And I just want to leave you something with one of my favorite working class artists that I've come to believe more and more. Nobody wins unless everybody wins. That's what we're about. Thank you for having me, brothers and sisters.
drinks it in his bottle and the water ain't no good. The dog drinks it, but he don't know if he should. Some folks say it's the nectar of the gods, but Coke is the drink of the death squads. Coke is the drink of the death squads. I want Coca Cola and the rest of the world to see the kind of clout campaigns about Coca Cola has. And uh, it's over here.